In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, we are continuing our series in the book of Daniel. And just to, to give you a little bit of background on this particular passage, when Daniel is saying this, Gabriel has come down and explained to him the visions that he's seeing and given him a sort of a, uh, a layman's version of all the visions that he has, has seen beforehand and gives him a prophecy of what is to happen. And so we're going to delve into Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 26, where Gabriel gives an explanation of this. And here he says, However, not all men have this knowledge. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, that's the verse from earlier. That was weird. Okay, sorry, Daniel 9, 25 through 26. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah Prince, uh, Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in the times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And, it, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be a war. Desolations are determined. So, in this particular prophecy, it seems as though what is being talked about, and, and it's pretty clear because Gabriel comes out and uses the phrase Messiah, the anointed one, in other words, referring to God's chosen son, Jesus, that he's giving a prophecy of this. And what's so amazing about this is you have to remember, this is during the captivity of Babylon. And without going into too much detail on the timeline, this was back when Daniel was writing this. This was before the temple was even founded. And what is he saying in this verse? That when the temple is reconstructed, because you remember that the temple has already been destroyed, the one that Solomon built, that that one was destroyed when Judea was taken over. So Jerusalem is going to have a new temple erected. Gabriel is predicting this. And when the new temple is erected, that is the one that the Messiah is going to enter. And if you know your history, the new temple was eventually reconstructed, actually reconstructed in a relatively short amount of time. And that new temple, though not as grand as the one that Solomon built, was the temple that Jesus worshipped at. That Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, and God in human flesh in, in that form, he went to that temple in Jerusalem. And so you're seeing the aspects of this property come true, and that the Messiah uh, and is going to be there, and that he is going to come in That when the, the temple is restored. So the temple is built, you've got a few hundred years pass, and then the Messiah is born, the Messiah comes into the temple. And what's interesting to note, too, is that after the Messiah has entered the temple, the prediction is that the temple is going to be destroyed. And if you, again, know your secular history, what happens in 70 AD, approximately 40 years after Christ has already ascended into heaven? Rome comes in and destroys the new temple. And so the temple serves its purpose, and here we see hundreds of years before the birth of church, uh, before the birth of Christ, and even before the new temple is restored and, and is reconstructed in Jerusalem, Gabriel is already informing Daniel the new temple is going to be built, and that is going to be the temple that the Messiah comes to, and after the Messiah leaves, that's when the temple is going to be destroyed. The history lines up with what Gabriel has said. And I think that it's important to note that the we can kind of draw a parallel here between the temple and the Old Testament. Both, in a sense, are something that were there and served a purpose for a time. We see this repeated over and over again 
in the book of Hebrews that the the old things are a shadow of what is to come. And so it's true that, that God had a special relationship with Israel for a long time, and it served its purpose. In the same sense, God had an original temple, and it served its purpose. And it was destroyed, and then Israel resurrected it. It created a new temple, and it served its purpose too. See, all these things that happen in history, in our finite human mindset, especially one that only focuses on the physical realm, we would almost look back at that and say, well, what was the point of, of building it in the first place if it was just going to be destroyed by Rome later? It was to fulfill this prophecy, and so there was a temple for Christ to go to in Jerusalem for all the prophecies to be fulfilled. Christ entered into the city. He entered into this temple multiple times. As a young Jewish man, he would have gone to the temple probably every Passover, at least based on the scripture that we have. And so this temple served its purpose, just like the nation of Israel served its purpose. And then we know later on, it stopped serving its purpose. The whole point of the entirety of the Old Testament and the entirety of the temple and the sacrifices and everything else was to prepare this earth for the coming of the Christ. That's what the whole thing was about. In fact, there's a really great quote by C.S. Lewis where he talks about the Bible reads as though it is one continuous narrative. And it is. But it's written in different styles by different authors over a vast amount of time. And yet, the story of Christ brings everything together. It makes everything in the Old Testament make sense. It's not as though it was an addendum that was tacked on to the end of it. It's more like it was the chapter that was always intended to be written to make everything else that happened earlier in the book make sense. And that's what's really so fascinating about it, and to me is one of the greatest proofs of the divinity of Scripture, that no one single human, and I say this as a, a novelist myself, could have crafted a story that made that much sense, much less 40 different authors over more than a thousand years who didn't know each other, who could not have possibly predicted all of this, and it all comes together in one coherent narrative. And Daniel plays a part in that. Daniel's prophecy here lets us know, hey, the Messiah is coming, the temple is going to be rebuilt, it's going to be established, he's going to go there, he's going to worship, and then when he's gone, it will have served its purpose, and just like everything else in the old law, it will be swept away. Because now, we're all heirs of Abraham. We all have that connection to God and his covenant, and all those that are washed in his son's blood can share in the rewards and the privileges of being a child of God, just like the Israelites could in old times. The whole purpose of having that story, of having that relationship with God, was to make the world ready for the coming Christ, whose blood would be given up as an offering for all people of this earth to come into a right relationship with their Creator. Stay the course, friends. Oh, hey. What are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock, so go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell and if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then. In the meantime, I'm going to take a nap.